different species is not pre-labeled. It is not categorized. So what we have to do in order to adapt to this environment is to use cognition, to use perceptual categorization, to use conceptual categorization, to use goal setting, to use expectations, which is cognitive. Which means that we have to understand how brain does this using higher order functions. Any suggestions of how cognitive control is realized without the brain are as <coughs> hopeless as suggestions how behavior is realized without higher brain functions and cognition. So in order to relate these two approaches, I'm going to speak today about a particular episodes in behavior which are related to behavioral plasticity. Behavioral plasticity can be defined as modifications of behavior. As ethologists noted, modifications of behavior in ecological niches without, within the norms of reaction of the species are usually adaptive. Adaptive modifications of behavior as defined by Conrad Lawrence is learning. So we are interested in how brain is learning. Also, when we speak of behavioral plasticity and learning, we are usually interested in long-term modifications of behavior because this is something which allows the animal to repeat the performance under the repeated environmental conditions. So we are interested in learning and memory. And we want to know how brain is adapting through the cognitive uh, functions to the environmental challenges. Uh, the way to approach this is to look at the activity of the brain during this cognitive performance. The difficulty which we face here is that usually this is the whole brain, if not to speak about the whole organism, which uh, is performing cognitive function. So we need to understand how large brain systems of distributed anatomical elements and neurons uh, are cooperating in a particular tasks of adapting to particular environments. Our approach here is functional systems theory. Functional systems are defined as co-active uh, networks of elements of distinct anatomical location which cooperate towards achievement of adaptive results which are selected for in the episodes of natural selection or somatic selection in uh, ontogenetic time. Uh, and they are the specialists in the brain which are performing particular adaptive functions. Therefore, our uh, approach and the logo which you see uh, in this talk is that for the brain functions, uh, what we have inside is not a processor and computer metaphor, Intel inside, but functional systems inside. So to refine our problem of what are the neural basis of uh, adaptive behavioral plasticity. We are interested in knowing how such distributed networks of neurons, which are adaptive and bear cognitive functions, are formed during individual development and learning. This is rapidly growing field in the recent years. And one thing which I would like to note is that it is a subject of the graph theoretical analysis. We can view a functional system 
distributed network of elements as a graph with uh, all features uh, of complex graphs, it is becoming more and more evident that these types of graphs uh, belong to a particular category of drafts, graphs which are hierarchically organized, modular, small world networks. What characterizes uh, uh, such networks is that they consist of different uh, models which uh, are of different locations. And the elements in these models are usually more tightly linked than the uh, elements between the modules. Also, very typical of such systems is that they have a connective core which links different peripheral uh, modules so that each element of one module can rapidly reach uh, synchronization with the element of another module with a few connections through the central connective core. Uh, we are interested in understanding how these models and small world uh, networks are operating in the brain uh, to understand how these elements uh, become specialists in the particular functional systems, how they are rapidly retrieved uh, during uh, activation of particular behavior, so how this network is synchronized, and how they are acquired during learning. To relate the functional systems uh, approach to a number of other approaches I, which were developed in the West, I will mention just a few of them. Uh, neuronal assemblies, uh, theoretical analysis of Donald Hebb, uh, distributed systems where Vernon Mount Castle pointed at the uh, fact that such functional systems uh, have uh, distribution, uh, he was interested particularly in the various areas of the cerebral cortex in the cortical columns, or global mappings within the uh, theory of neuronal group selection by Gerald Edelman, where he was interested in the functional cluster, the central functional cluster, which integrates different elements, especially under the conditions of primary and secondary consciousness. As Wolf Singer and uh, his co-authors wrote already more than 10 years ago, this approach of looking at uh, the essence of the brain and its function through these distributed uh, cognitive functional networks brings us to a fundamental paradigmatic shift uh, in cognitive neuroscience towards explaining cognitive functions in terms of coherent behavior of large neuronal populations that are dynamically bound within and across subsystems. What is important, though, is that, as always, the conceptual orientation a theory suggests a new type of approaches and requires new types of tools. So as Singer and co-authors wrote, as a concept is as a consequence of this conceptual orientation, new research strategies are being developed to analyze the dynamic interaction between large number of neurons and to monitor the formation of functionally coherent assemblies in complex sensory motor context. This is what I'm going to speak today. But the situation with the development of new techniques is not that favored. If we will look at the predictions from the functional systems theory into what we need to achieve empirically to study these systems experimentally, this is quite tough. First, we need to look for individual neurons. <coughs> One of the major uh, theoretical predictions and experimental uh, fun findings from the functional network analysis is if you look uh, at one particular anatomical structure uh, where you have a population of neurons, different neurons 
within the population will be involved in different functional systems, and neighboring neurons will be involved in different functional systems. So you cannot effectively average the activity of the neurons in the large area in order to uh, understand the distributed ensemble. You have to have a single cell uh, resolution. But you have to have it at systems level. You cannot study just a small network within a particular brain structure in order to understand the organization of the whole adaptive uh, functional system. So you need to have a single cell resolution, but at the systems level across different brain structures. And the third is that since these functional systems are forming a primary and secondary repertoires of the developed and acquired uh, systems which are stored in memory, it is only during the performance period of a particular functional system when the behavior is performed we can effectively study this system. So what we need is a conscious animal in behaving uh, conditions and uh, situations of uh, learning or adaptation where we can observe these functional systems. If we will look at this well-known diagram, which is constantly updating, of different techniques which we uh, have for the analysis uh, of the uh, brain functions across different scales and time domains. We can see that none of the existing techniques is efficient uh, to address the question we are interested in. For example, if we will look uh, at a different whole brain imaging techniques like functional MRI or PET, the best will be functional MRI because it has uh, a better resolution. Since, uh, nevertheless, uh, since the effective resolution of MRI, MRI is still in the range of millimeter, and in one cubic millimeter of the cerebral cortex, for example, in humans, we have up to uh, 80,000 uh, neurons. This is not sufficient in order to discriminate activity uh, of particular functional system across the whole brain. You can think of this as a huge stock exchange where there are uh, thousands of brokers uh, 80,000 of brokers belonging to different tasks and performances, which you monitor uh, because of their uh, in involvement in different operations. If you average it to one pixel, you will just perform uh, the uh, monitoring of the global stock exchange operation. This is, will be a pixel in the fMRI imaging. If you will look at uh, single unit recordings, they have excellent temporal resolution or optical recordings uh, for uh, voltage-sensitive dyes, for example. But uh, as Pavel uh, Balaban told in uh, his talk, uh, we have a problem with optical recordings uh, unless uh, we have very small uh, animals like C. elegans, for example. It is that we cannot uh, under the microscope image with cellular resolution the whole uh, neural network involved in the behavior of the single animal. So I'm going to describe today one particular approach which we developed uh, in order to overcome some of these difficulties. As all of the previous approaches, it has its limitations. But uh, at least it faces some of the requirements which I listed earlier. We are looking at the single cell level in uh, systems uh, level performance and in behaving animals. 
the approach is based on a particular property of neurons during acquisition of new behavior. Uh, it is that when neurons learn, when they are involved into a new network, they start to express certain genes which are not active when they are the same neurons are involved in performing the stereotyped behaviors. We were uh, looking for these genes in the beginning of uh, 1980s, in 85, 84, because we were interested in question whether we can identify genes which are necessary for long-term memory storage. From the pioneering work uh, in 1960s, it was known that gene expression, that is RNA synthesis and protein synthesis, is involved in uh, establishment of new long-term memories. Because uh, when animals learn, there is a burst of mRNA and protein synthesis. And if the uh, inhibitors of uh, RNA or protein synthesis are applied, it is possible to prevent formation of long-term memory. But what genes are upregulated and necessary for long-term memory was not uh, known because it was beyond the uh, techniques of biochemistry in 1960s. <coughs> we returned to this question of molecular neuro in the uh, middle of 1980s, and we're looking uh, for uh, genes upregulated during learning in the brain. We use different approaches. Ma most of them failed. But one, uh, there were not many genes known uh, to be expressed in the brain in 1985. Uh, and most of the molecular neurobiologists, or most of the molecular biologists, were not interested in uh, molecular neurobiology. So along with studying uh, different uh, uh, approaches by cDNA cloning for genes of synapses, for example, mRNA transported to synapses during learning or in uh, uh, learned versus under conditions, we are doing some of the traditional molecular biology uh, work uh, in molecular oncology, collaborating with people at the Institute of Molecular Biology and Molecular Genetics uh, in Moscow. <laughs> and they were interested in proton genes. The genes, uh, which are cellular genes, uh, uh, being uh, captured by viral uh, elements uh, in order to propagate uh, uh, in the cells by stimulating the uh, proliferation. Uh, so the, that was known uh, problem in the uh, molecular oncology, but the question what uh, the proton genes are doing in the uh, normal uh, cells was not known, though it was supposed that they might be involved in the regulation of cellular differentiation and development. And to study this problem, we uh, did in situ hybridization with a number of nuclear proton genes uh, during uh, embryonic development uh, in rats, looking uh, whether the proliferating uh, cells, especially, uh, for example, uh, in liver here is uh, 18 days uh, embryo and uh, liver uh, is hematopoietic at this moment, uh, as well as uh, the bone marrow. Uh, whether uh, these uh, genes will be involved in differentiation in these tissues. Uh, however, rather unexpectedly for this project, it uh, appeared that some of these nuclear proton genes, like CFOS uh, shown here, uh, is also active during uh, development in the developing uh, forebrain. Since that was one of the few genes known to be active uh, during uh, regulation of differentiation in the nervous system from this uh, guess, we further guess that maybe this differentiation uh, can be upregulated 
and the developmental plasticity uh, can be turned on into experience-dependent plasticity in the adult brain, and therefore we decided to test uh, whether such genes uh, can be regulated by behavior, specifically by learning in the adult brain. And the very first experiments, which we did in uh, 1986 with the active avoidance learning in rats, showed that uh, the control animals show very few uh, mRNA for uh, CFOS. Uh, there is very low level expression of expression in the home uh, cage conditions. Though animals are behaving there, but their behavior is familiar and stereotyped. But whenever we are subjecting animals to novel experiences, uh, we have strong activation uh, very rapidly in 15 minutes of mRNA for these genes. So these genes are upregulated during learning. Of course, there are many situations when genes can be upregulated by uh, certain conditions. So we did a number of control experiments testing for the specificity of this uh, regulation for uh, acquisition of new experience, but just not for, let's say, motor performance or sensory stimulations. Or uh, we checked with uh, injection of antisense whether uh, the not generally protein synthesis, but upregulation of this particular RNAs like CFOS is necessary for uh, long-term memory formation. And as you can see here, for example, uh, we injected CFOS antisense and scrambled oligonucleotides and looked for acquisition. And this is acquisition curve, which is equal for uh, scrambled and antisense. 30 minutes later, if we check for the performance, there is no difference, but if uh, 24 hours uh, is uh, an interval between the end of acquisition and beginning of testing. In the first 20 trials of testing, where we test not for the further learning, but for retention of memory, we see strong impairment uh, of performance. We uh, also showed that when the behavior becomes stereotyped uh, after, let's say, days of training, starting here, for example, from the sixth day of training. And if we will look for uh, active uh, behavior, like uh, conditioned active avoidance uh, behavior in this task on the ninth day, despite the fact that animals are performing very active uh, avoidance reaction, there is no uh, upregulation of uh, CFOS and CJUN, we were interested at that moment also, uh, comparable to the passive control animals and comparing to the training conditions. So it is the novelty of the task which is critical. We also showed that this uh, expression is present in various species, for example, uh, in uh, birds or in snails. And uh, even after short episodes of training, like here we have a passive avoidance task where chicks are presented with the bead, which they pack immediately because they think uh, it is edible, but it is covered by a bitter tasting substance. So this is a mistake. They learn it very well and remember it uh, for several days. This is protein synthesis long-term memory. And the areas where uh, the changes uh, are occurring uh, to store these memories are known. So when we look for uh, mRNA for CFOS uh, under this single trial, 30 second uh, learning conditions, 15 minutes later, we see significant upregulation of the, of the expression. So these and other uh, experiments has led us to uh, conclusion that 
uh, probably expression of immediate early genes due to their uh, properties that it occurs uh, specifically in neurons but not in glial cells is very rapid mRNA uh, is induced in minutes in cell culture you can see the protein in, in five minutes or three five minutes I, I will show you a bit later uh, how it is used presently in rapid mapping techniques very important, it has very low background level. As you saw on the, one of the first slides, the home cage uh, conditioned animals uh, have very low level of, for example, c force expression, which means that you do not need to make a subtraction of experimental conditions from the background like uh, it is necessary, for example, in deoxyglucose labeling when the utilization of deoxyglucose is always present. Uh, in the brain, and there is a slight upregulation uh, in particular lo uh, cognitive loads. It is induced uh, during uh, learning and induced by novelty. Uh, I have to say that it is rather universal, so uh, in most situations of novelty, uh, you will find the circuit uh, which is responsible uh, for this behavior, uh, which can be mapped by one of the immediate early genes. It is not localized, or at least uh, to a high degree, not localized to a particular type of uh, brain regions. So we can use this for mapping uh, of plasticity in neurons uh, across different uh, brain areas. Under uh, certain conditions, it depends on NMDA receptor activity and synchronization. So this is uh, what we would expect from the neurons involved in the uh, uh, particular uh, newly synchronized ensemble during acquisition of learning. It is involved in long-term changes because uh, knocking down, as I showed you, with antisense or uh, more uh, later uh, experiments with uh, different uh, conditional knockouts for uh, different immediate early genes is critical for the performance of uh, acquired behavior. So it is necessary for long-term memory and for its consolidation. So the advantage. of this approach is following. If we have a particular neuron, which is involved in functional system one, and it fires action potentials in this performance. If this system is stereotyped, we will see the uh, response in electrophysiological experiments, but there will be no activation of uh, uh, immediate early gene expression. If, however, we see a new network being established during learning into which this neuron is recruited for the first time. We will see the genomic response which allows us to differentiate in the brain these populations. So there are many functional systems, many specialists wor working uh, simultaneously in the brain. If we will be able to visualize this just by neuronal recordings, we will see a lot of activity uh, with different time overlaps, which is difficult to interpret. 
So if we will look, however, at the genomic response, we will see that for the first acquisition of network, there will be genomic activation along with the traditional electrophysiological uh, correlates of this activity. However, during repeated stimulations, what we will see is that electrophysiologically the activity will continue while the genomic response will go down of a bit of Therefore, we can discriminate new ensembles formed during acquisition of new behavior, ignoring the background of many other ensembles which are active at the same moment. So we suggested this uh, technique to map large ensembles of neurons during learning at the end of 80s in 1989 uh, and used mainly C4 activity for these purposes. However, later experiments showed that there is a whole cascade of cellular signaling which leads to CFOS activation. And some of the components of uh, this cascade can be also efficiently used for as molecular markers uh, for plasticity in such type of functional systems mapping experiments. For example, one of molecules uh, which can be used uh, even with the more rapid uh, uh, detection uh, is uh, CREP, calcium cyclic IMP response uh, binding element protein. Uh, it is a constitutive transcription factor which uh, is required to bind the CRA element uh, this element in the promoter of immediate early genes like CFOS or ZIF268. Uh, I will come to this uh, later. It is being uh, phosphorylated and uh, up uh, to uh, its transportation into the nucleus in the phosphorylated form to bind the CRE element upon the arrival of converging stimuli uh, involved acquisition, in acquisition of new experience. And uh, this pathway is also universally represented uh, in different species, uh, in, uh, in vertebrates, in vertebrates, and phosphocrep, to which you can uh, obtain and de develop uh, antibodies can be used as another marker of plasticity in the functional uh, neuronal networks. Uh, ZIF268 uh, was another uh, transcription factor uh, which was discovered not through the molecular oncology mainly but by the different uh, responses uh, it has different names because it was uh, simultaneously discovered by different groups uh, by uh, responses either to uh, neural activity or to the growth factors. And it is also upregulated uh, in learning. CFOS and ZIF are transcription factors. Uh, lately, it, uh, it became evident that uh, immediate early genes represent at least two large families uh, of uh, genes. 
some of the genes are transcription factors. They are necessary to coordinatedly regulate many other late effector genes. But some of the immediate early genes are this themselves uh, effector genes. They are also upregulated very rapidly. The criterion for immediate early gene is that it has to be induced by transcription in response to stimulus rapidly, and uh, the protein synthesis has not to be involved in uh, mediation of this response. So this has to be a direct signaling without uh, involving of intermediates. So if we will take this formal uh, criteria for rapid activation by neural activity uh, of uh, some of the genes, we will see that among immediate early genes are uh, effector genes like BDNF, for example, which can behave as immediate early gene. That means that when you, uh, for example, produce seizures, uh, synchronized activity model, which is very often used to identify uh, plasticity-related genes. And you do this uh, on the background of the protein synthesis inhibitor, you will see still very rapid upregulation of uh, BDNF mRNA in 15 minutes. Some of these uh, genes are coding for proteins like ARC and HOMER uh, 1A, which are necessary for regulations in synapses. For example, ARC uh, gene is uh, encoding mRNA, which is uh, transported to polyribosomes uh, of the postsynaptic regions. And the protein uh, is synthesized uh, there, localized uh, in synapses, and uh, as well as Homer 1A is involved in uh, rearrangement of synapses under the conditions of stimulation and plasticity, involving trafficking, uh, including trafficking of some of the receptors, AMPA receptors, for example, or reorganization of the cytoskeleton. <coughs> So effectively, we have a whole set of uh, different genes which can be used now as a markers for plasticity in neuronal network. Uh, more recent uh, differential uh, cloning and differential uh, RNA uh, display uh, experiments for the genes which are involved uh, in plasticity show that uh, uh, these screens, as well as microarray screens, uh, usually give from 500 to 1,000 uh, genes, which can be upregulated rapidly uh, in the brain in response to a particular uh, neuronal activity challenge. Now we have next question. But how can we visualize the whole network? employing these neurogenetical uh, markers, molecular probes for plasticity. As I mentioned, we need uh, the whole brain in the behavior to see the functional network. Of course, we can do it by serial sections, and we've been doing this for a long time using uh, either in situ hybridization with the probes for uh, immediate early genes or immunocytochemistry, doing it on section by section, hundreds of sections for the brain, making uh, three-dimensional reconstructions of this in order to visualize the whole neuronal network. But this is very laborious and not very prone to accumulation of large amount of data necessary for statistical analysis and between group comparisons. <coughs> so beside, besides traditional tools for a detection of uh, proteins uh, or mRNA of these genes under conditions of uh, different cognitive loads and learning tasks, we started to develop the 3D uh, visualization tools, which would be more uh, efficient in visualizing the whole brain network. 
three elements of uh, the approach is shown here. One, we need to detect uh, expression in the tissue. And if it is a whole brain, it is rather uh, difficult uh, if you do not cut it in histological sections. Nevertheless, we developed uh, techniques for uh, whole mount in situ hybridization and immunocytochemistry, where you incubate a sample, like the whole area of the brain, or the whole brain region, like whole hippocampus of the adult mouse, or the whole cerebral cortex of the mouse, or even the whole brain of the young mouse, with antibodies against a particular product of immediate allergy or uh, mRNA. And by increasing uh, the penetration of uh, the antibodies by a number of procedures, like, for example, freezing and thawing, uh, you can achieve quite deep penetration of the antibody to uh, stain the whole brain region or the whole brain. Second, we need to visualize this without uh, cutting uh, the brain into traditional uh, histological sections. And for this, we uh, use two approaches, optical clearing, and uh, single plane elimination microscopy. First, about optical clearing. Even if we have a stained uh, brain, for example, with the antibodies uh, and secondary fluorescent antibodies, how can we visualize it in the whole brain? It is not transparent. So this uh, uh, approach is to make it optically clear. It is possible, it has been known uh, with neuroanatomy and uh, classical anatomy since the end of the 19th century, that if you will replace uh, the water uh, in the fixed uh, tissue uh, with the uh, substances which have uh, the same uh, scattering uh, coefficient uh, as the components of uh, neural tissue, membranes and uh, proteins, especially myelin, you can achieve uh, the light to penetrate uh, the tissue without uh, being absorbed uh, by it, which gives you possibility uh, to optically clear not even whole brains, as you see here, but uh, it has been rumored, for example, that in St. Petersburg, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, there was a whole human corpse being optically cleared uh, in a similar way. We looked for old anatomists who were doing this, were not very successful in finding them, so we started to develop our own protocols uh, using old literature, and here you can see uh, the results of this optical clearing. This is a newborn ma mouse brain, which is easier uh, because there is less myelin, and this is 14 days old mouse brain. Uh, they are uh, photographed on the background of a uh, list of paper, uh, which you can see here in the clearing solution. And this is before clearing, and this is after clearing. We uh, use different uh, protocols. Some of them we found in the literature. These are traditional protocols for optical clearing, which were published uh, beforehand. You can see that uh, this is the whole uh, mouse brain. Uh, that it is possible to achieve uh, substantial clearing, but not efficient enough, especially for the adult uh, brain, uh, the areas of thalamus uh, and uh, melanated areas of thalamus are deep uh, under the cerebral cortex, are difficult to clear. But this is the protocol which we developed, and you can see here uh, also the adult mouse brain, but you cannot see it because uh, it is optically transparent. Another problem is that 
even if you have this optically cleared brain uh, stained for uh, one of the products of immediate early genes, so potentially having the whole network which was active during a cognitive episode. Uh, if you will uh, illuminate it by traditional fluorescence microscopy, you will get a mess because uh, the overlay of many projections of the three-dimensional network will not reveal you the three-dimensional structure. So to achieve uh, the 3D uh, appearance uh, of uh, uh, detected network. We use the technique of uh, ultramicroscopy, uh, a particular uh, version of sheet plane uh, or single plane uh, illumination microscopy, which was developed uh, initially at the beginning of the 20th century. And the basic idea uh, of uh, this approach is that you eliminate uh, the sample not from below uh, <coughs> with the light going to objective, but from the side. And this allows you, if you use uh, laser uh, mm -hmm. for a particular uh, wavelength uh, like we used here, to excite uh, the fluorescence in a very uh, thin sheet of light, which is cutting like a knife your sample. Uh, Hans Ulrich Dott, who uh, picked up this technique uh, from the old microscopy and applied it to laser microscopy, showed that it is possible by using different lenses to focus uh, uh, the uh, single plane in the way that it can be narrowed down to few microns. So we adopted this technique and developed our own design by, based on the conventional uh, Olympus mic mic microscopy. Uh, which uh, in the region of the sample allows you to have the beam waves of about uh, six microns to eliminate uh, the uh, plane of about uh, 20 millimeters. So you can uh, effectively uh, excite fluorescence in a very uh, thin uh, optical, uh, virtual op optical sections of the whole brain. I will put off the light for a moment. So this is just to illustrate the possibilities of this technique. This is the mouse, 16-day-old uh, uh, mouse embryo, which we imaged uh, with uh, uh, this ultramicroscopy technique, based not on staining, but just on autofluorescence. You can see that here is a defect. It was uh, here. It was attached to the base uh, on which it was imaged, so it was not optically transparent. But uh, for uh, the rest uh, of the embryo, you can uh, image uh, the whole volume. You can dissect it and uh, see different optical uh, densities uh, based on the threshold of. Uh, uh, detection, you can make virtual sections uh, through uh, the whole uh, tissue and visualize it at a particular uh, levels of uh, expression, which is important for uh, discriminating uh, immunopositive neurons, as you will see in the next uh, slide. So the next thing which we did we used uh, the first part of the approach, which is a whole body immuno, uh, uh, whole brain immunocytochemistry or brain structures immunocytochemistry, and uh, tried to visualize the 
uh, activity of uh, different genes, uh, like CFOS here, in the adult uh, brain with ultramicroscopy after uh, acquisition of new experience in single trial tasks like fear conditioning. So the light is not uh, good enough for the, blue, uh, for the green fluorescence, but still you can see here, this is the whole mo adult mouse hippocampus, uh, which is virtually rotated after uh, ultramicroscopy. And what you see here, the uh, vessels, uh, this is blood, out of fluorescence of uh, blood in the sample. And the small uh, dots here, uh, are CFOS immunopositive neurons uh, after a single uh, session of fear conditioning in the mouse brain. You can do it even for the whole brain uh, if the animal is young enough. This is a uh, uh, two week uh, old uh, mouse uh, with a whole brain uh, immunocytochemistry uh, for uh, ZIF268, one of the transcriptional factors, after uh, acquisition uh, of uh, a new experience, single trial experience, uh, with the cellular <coughs> resolution. After you obtain uh, this three dimensional uh, distributions. You can use uh, the current uh, software for three-dimensional cellular analysis, like Imaris from Bitplane, to uh, threshold uh, the levels and to quantify uh, the location and expression uh, of the uh, neurons which are involved in these tasks. Now, the next thing is when we obtain these individual images, what do we do uh, next besides quantification? We need uh, the analysis and specifically statistical uh, analysis. We need to uh, compare groups of uh, individual animals uh, belonging to particular treatment conditions and to see uh, what are partners of their expression and the difference in these partners. For uh, this purpose, we are currently developing the technique, uh, which is similar to functional uh, brain imaging in humans. Uh, while in traditional uh, neuroanatomy uh, and using uh, markers for cellular activity like immediate early genes, the usual approach is to have sections and to isolate by uh, regions of interest by masks, the areas where you can count the number of neurons. Uh, this is very limiting for several reasons. First, most of the areas are not analyzed and uh, they are uh, not according to your hypothesis might lie the important uh, changes. Second uh, is that uh, what we learned from immediate early gene expression is that uh, you cannot effectively, uh, in most of the cases, make a mean value for particular brain stru structures because they are very inhomogeneous. If you look, for example, we did, uh, for example, this for different areas of the cortex or the whole hippocampus. If you look for the whole hippocampus, ventral hippocampus or dorsal hippocampus in the anterior posterior axis, you will see that it's uh, a gradient of activity. Different portions of hippocampus are involved uh, in the anterior or posterior pole in different tasks. So if you will take uh, uh, few sections uh, in the middle of the uh, hippocampus, you cannot project it to uh, the whole brain area. Uh, in avian uh, brain, where we did a lot of work, it is even more striking. Uh, 
patterns of expression do not follow anatomical regions. So we have the anatomical borders, but expression is taking only a portion of a particular anatomical region and can continue in the neighboring region, which is also expressed, expressing uh, this gene only by some of the neurons. So we need a more global mapping approach. And uh, the way we are doing it now, we are using it for two-dimensional sections obtained uh, for this, uh, from this optical sectioning and developing the three-dimensional protocol. We are like in functional brain imaging, what we do, we take all the pixels uh, of the image, we uh, normalize each image to the brain atlas so that we can fit one image into another. And for each pixel or uh, in the future uh, voxel of uh, the brain will have the statistical estimation of the activity and statistical differences between uh, the experimental and control group which can be then mapped back on this uh, particular anatomical pixel or voxel uh, as an index of the uh, variability uh, of expression in this uh, pixel or voxel, or the statistical differences, for example, t-test uh, with the p-value for the t-test between the experimental and the control group. I didn't put uh, these images into presentation, but if you will ask me uh, later uh, after the lecture or just immediately, I can show you how it looks like for two-dimensional images. So what kind of questions uh, we can start to ask using this three-dimensional network imaging approaches with the cellular resolution. We might be interested in a very uh, simple but important question. How many neurons are involved, for example, in encoding a single particular experience or behavior in the brain or in particular brain structure in dentite jars or uh, in C1 or C3 or the whole hippocampus or particular brain cortex uh, uh, regions. How these uh, recruited neurons vary from one uh, performance of behavior to another? I will show you in a moment, uh, which requires some additional explanation, that it is becoming possible to repeatedly sample the same brain and the same neuronal circuitry for repeated performance of the behavior to compare the populations of neurons involved in one instance of behavior and the second instance of behavior. Is, for example, performance of the same behavior which was acquired recently or uh, long time ago, remote memory, involve the same or different neurons in the cortex or hippocampus, for example, of the animal? Uh, how the proportion of these recruited neurons vary from one brain structure uh, or its part to another? What is the involvement in particular specific tasks? Etc. Now, some of the applications and extension of uh, the initial framework which I showed you here. One of the most important for our mapping uh, approaches uh, is this one. <coughs> when we just found expression of uh, immediate early genes uh, under conditions of learning, uh, I was absolutely confident in the diagram which I showed you here. Uh, so my claim was very bold, and in the 80s I was suggesting that you can easily differentiate uh, the functional systems which are uh, established during acquisition of new experience from the rest of the activity uh, of uh, already uh, consolidated functional systems which show no expression. That was a major mm, claim for the mapping of new functional system. However, the facts 
which war against this war in front of our eyes. Because we knew from our first experiments that when you make a, a continuous acquisition of experience in several sessions, so you make one a session one day, a second session on the second day. I uh, showed you on one of the previous slides, but didn't uh, focus on this. On the second day, you will still, 24 hours later, you will still have uh, activation of expression in the similar situation. Though by behavioral performance, uh, the memory uh, was acquired uh, during the first episode. Classical example for this is fear conditioning. <clears throat> if you use a single trial fear conditioning in mice, where you associate uh, context or uh, context plus auditory signal with the food shock. They will uh, remember uh, the context and signal 24 hours later, uh, demonstrating freezing. So 24 hours later, a day later, we are performing the retrieval episode. But what we found uh, at the beginning of 90s was that during this retrieval, there is also <coughs> strong upregulation of uh, CFOS expression uh, in the brain. You can see here, for example, uh, this is testing uh, a day after acquisition. Uh, this is CFOS immune reactivity in hippocampus of mice comparable to uh, control mice, which were trained a day earlier but were kept uh, in their home cages. And you can see uh, strong upregulation uh, both to context and uh, a reminder with the condition stimulus comparable to the uh, control animals. So what does that mean? Why these genes are active uh, during uh, reactivation of memories? The simple explanation will be that the memory is not yet uh, completely established, and this is additional experience which is being formed. But we tested for the optional explanation. <coughs> we decided to test what will happen if we will inhibit this induction of gene expression. And we know that, for example, when CFOS is induced, it is a transcriptional factor. Uh, it is not induced alone. Uh, it is induced in the company of other immediate early genes. And furthermore, uh, its induction uh, leads to uh, upregulation of the second wave of protein uh, synthesis later on. So uh, there is a whole uh, set of proteins which are uh, activated and synthesized during uh, recall of this uh, experience. We were interested uh, what they are for. Uh, are they necessary for additional acquisition and how they relate to the initial experience? So what we did uh, both on uh, chicks, uh, which is one of our favorite uh, objects, and in mice, we injected animals with the protein synthesis inhibitor, not during uh, acquisition of memory, where you would expect that uh, it will disrupt formation of new memory because there is an activation of uh, transcription and uh, following machinery uh, for modification of the cell. But during retrieval, and we knew that already that during retrieval something similar is happening. We were interested whether uh, this relates to the circuitry which was established during acquisition. So the experiment here is a uh, following one. It is a single trial learning, so it is easy uh, to perform and to test. Uh, chicks are presented uh, with a, a bitter uh, bit with methylentranilate. And uh, several hours later, or 24 hours later, the important is that uh, uh, the time passes uh, for the protein synthesis dependent memory to be uh, established. We uh, 
reactivate this memory by presenting the same bit, which is already not covered by a bitter substance, but it doesn't matter because they recognize it and avoid it. And one of the uh, groups is just presented uh, with the bead uh, and injected intracranially into the areas where we know <clears throat> that immediate allergen expression is happening <clears throat> with saline. Another group is uh, injected uh, with the protein synthesis inhibitor, anisomycin in this case, but not reactivated. So there is no presentation of the visual cue to uh, retrieve memory. And the third group is combination. Uh, so what you can see here, uh, it's cyclogeximide in this experiment. We used both uh, of protein synthesis inhibitors to be sure uh, that it is dependent on the protein synthesis itself. Uh, this is the group which uh, is uh, uh, injected with the protein synthesis inhibitor without reactivation, and it performs uh, at 90% uh, at later test. This is the group which is uh, just uh, reminded with the saline, and uh, it performs uh, at the same high level. However, if we combine these two, uh, we see that the experience which was acquired uh, previously can be disrupted. We tested this uh, later uh, in mice and comparable to chicks which develop rapidly and it is difficult to test days later. We can see that uh, even uh, a month later, reactivation uh, of uh, fear by different stimuli, by condition stimuli uh, like uh, tone or uh, by context uh, combined with the injection of protein synthesis can disrupt uh, previously established uh, memory. Uh, this was uh, later confirmed by uh, several other groups. So we know this uh, paradigm as a reconsolidation now. But what it means in terms of mapping. It tells us that we can have actually two episodes of the same functional system activation. One during acquisition And the second, during retrieval. And contrary to my initial uh, suggestion and expectation uh, from the first experiments, we will have uh, activation in both cases, which we can compare. So we can ask the question, is the same circuitry is involved in acquisition and it is reactivated during a retrieval. We can ask whether while memory is maturing and uh, undergoing systems consolidation, whether parts of this circuitry is redistributed in the brain so that other brain areas or other uh, neurons are being involved. And we can also make uh, a following experiment. We can start comparing, for example, two episodes of retrieval. So just repeatedly presenting the same stimulus to the network uh, in episode one and in episode two, which can be spaced by short time or longer time, 
we can start asking how stable are memory representations and is there a real memory trace as it was hypothesized uh, in the n-gram uh, metaphor. So do we have the same neurons? And furthermore, do we have the same synapses? Because we can also level with ARC uh, the synapses which are uh, being activated during uh, repeated retrievals of what seems by behavioral performance uh, to be the same. So on, in my final part, I will focus on few further applications which allow to uh, develop uh, and uh, extend uh, these mapping approaches. One of the techniques is to use transgenic mice with uh, gene fluorescent proteins, for example, and the promoters of immediate early genes. Like uh, the mouse strain, which was developed by Alison Bath, and which bears gene fluorescent protein and the promoter of CFOS. So when you have a particular sensory stimuli. Here uh, she works uh, with the somatosensory cortex. You can see the stimulation of Ibrisa. Uh, the whole circuitry for uh, part of the network by detecting uh, gene fluorescent protein. For us it is important because we do not need with such reporter mouse strains to do uh, laborious and not very efficient whole mount immunocytochemistry or in situ hybridization. We can rely on uh, using transgenic uh, reporter mice with the uh, endogenous fluorescence uh, of GFP activated by uh, CFOS responding, promoter responding to signals uh, under conditions of learning. Another way to use a reporter uh, technologies is to use uh, beta-galactosidase beta gene and the promoter of immediate early gene, like uh, was done by the group of Mark uh, Murphy in Flory Institute in Melbourne, where they also used a tau part attached to beta galactosidase which uh, allows to express uh, beta galactosidase uh, which is usually absent uh, from the uh, mammalian uh, nervous system uh, together with the uh, part of the tau protein which transports the whole protein uh, induced after C4 uh, uh, promoter induction to all the neurons. So what you can uh, see here is not only that you can map uh, in these transgenic uh, animals the uh, expression uh, of endogenous C4 by these reporter techniques. Here, for example, is the control counter-stained uh, section uh, of the brain, of the mouse brain uh, in the control conditions and here uh, expression which is easily detected by X-GAL staining uh, in uh, the anti and uh, uh, CE1 and CE3 regions after kinetic acid uh, seizures which is a model for synchronized activity. You can see here the individual neurons but what is more important, you can see uh, the uh, phenotype of these uh, neurons uh, by their uh, aberization uh, of uh, their dendrites and uh, the shape of the body. So extending this uh, analysis, for example, for behavioral uh, tasks, uh, Mark Murphy uh, and his uh, uh, collaborators showed that you can identify uh, neurons with a particular morphological phenotype 
which are active uh, here uh, after a single exposure to enriched uh, environment. These are control uh, conditions, these are handled animals, and this is uh, environmental exposure. And you can visualize the morphological phenotype of these uh, neurons in the dentite gyrus here, uh, or uh, in C3 region. And you can see, for example, that uh, in the dentate gyrus, there are specific fusiform shaped uh, neurons expressing uh, CFOS, which are uh, appearing only after exposure to a new environment. Furthermore, using uh, this lug Z uh, technology uh, to mark the CFOS responding neurons, you can dissect individually these neurons by laser capture microdissection for uh, subsequent uh, uh, genomic analysis or transcription uh, microarray analysis, isolating neurons which are specifically involved uh, in uh, large population, but uh, they bear the um, grouping under particular functional task. So here you can see uh, the section uh, from uh, amygdala uh, taken uh, and detection of uh, uh, LAGZ expression by x gal staining. This is uh, the same section uh, with the fluorescent uh, antibody. And you can see that these two are uh, quite nicely colocalized. So using uh, uh, x gal staining, you can isolate neurons which were involved in uh, acquisition of particular experience and uh, analyze transcriptional uh, profiles of these neurons uh, uh, comparable to the non-involved neurons. Another technique is to use bioluminescence. So you can put uh, CFOS promoter uh, to control firefly luciferase genes. And using this transgenic mice, you can uh, make non-invasive bioluminescence uh, imaging of uh, expression of the genes in, uh, in vivo repeatedly, for example, after different training episodes in the same animals with the uh, current uh, imaging uh, technologies. So here you, uh, you can see, for example, the experiment with the stimulation of the uh, Vibrisa and accumulation of bioluminescence uh, for the mouse uh, over uh, the uh, scalp uh, of the animal through the scalp in the cerebral cortex in the contralateral uh, hemisphere in the barrel field. And uh, this is the SPM analysis of the density map, statistical difference between the control and stimulated animals where you can localize the uh, expression of in vivo and uh, in vivo expression, and you can follow this dynamically, for example, with the repeated placement of the same animal uh, under different treatment conditions. This can be extended not only to transgenic animals, this is uh, another work uh, where uh, CFOS fire fly luciferase uh, uh, construct was transfected uh, into the brain uh, of the animal because this is chick. Uh, they didn't make transgenic chicks, but they were interested in uh, activity of these genes during uh, early uh, period after hatching in a printing uh, model with the visual imprinting. And what they did, they uh, transfected using electroporation technique uh, to the one-day-old chicks uh, this plasmid. And 15 uh, hours later, they subjected them to the session of imprinting. 
and uh, several hours uh, later, they tested them for the, the preference uh, for the uh, familiar and unfamiliar object, looking for in vivo uh, for bioluminescence uh, emitted uh, by uh, uh, CFOS induced luciferase expression. And this uh, diagram shows correlation between the uh, preference, behavioral preference of the animal running to one or other object, familiar and unfamiliar, and level of expression during retrieval. So here we are using already the retrieval strategy, not the acquisition strategy. Now, few applications uh, using simultaneous mapping of two episodes, which expands the imaging approach uh, dramatically. One of the techniques developed uh, for uh, this purpose was developed by uh, John Kozowski in Carol Barnes laboratory, and they called it compartment analysis of temporal activity by fluorescence in situ hybridization, or catfish. <coughs> There are various uh, implementations of this technique, but the idea uh, is generally the following. Uh, you use two different uh, probes, which will uh, be able to detect the activity of uh, neurons in one episode, and in the same uh, brain in the later episode. How this can be done? For example, if you will use uh, uh, one of the immediate early genes. They did it for uh, ARC, but the similar catfish uh, technique uh, is uh, present uh, now for CFOS also. You can use the probe which is uh, done to the introns, unprocessed uh, RNA. And using this probe, uh, you can localize uh, the rapidly uh, transcribed and early RNA molecules immediately after the stimulus in five minutes. I show, told you that you can uh, detect uh, um, activation very uh, rapidly. If you will use the second probe for in situ hybridization, which comes uh, across two exons so that it can detect only mRNA after splicing, it will show uh, localization uh, in the cytoplasm. So if you will wait for uh, 20 minutes, this uh, is, a, for example, an experiment where the animals were exposed to a new environment for five minutes, then waited in their home cage for 20 minutes, exposed for uh, another new environment for five minutes, and killed five minutes or immediately after that. And what you can see here, that you can see the late response, uh, which is from the first episode, and it is cytoplasmic, and the early response from the second episode uh, for the RNA, which is not yet processed, and uh, it can show you the localization. Here is another uh, application, uh, recent application, uh, for this uh, labeling, where uh, it is shown uh, by propidium iodide, uh, the nucleus, and there are four types of cells which can be categorized. This was done in amygdala after fear conditioning. So this uh, B1 are unstained, B2 are rapid, rapid response, uh, so five minutes, B3 are cytoplasmic late, and B4 are colocalization. So these are the neurons which are involved in two episodes. One uh, immediate nuclear, and the other is uh, uh, delayed cytoplasmic. So you can uh, see, for example, by testing, as I told you, twice within the 20 minutes time, whether the circuitry for the uh, retrieval of memory or involvement of neurons uh, during retrieval is stable uh, and is not varied. And finally, you can do this over days. This 
is another combination uh, of transgenic technologies, which was developed in Mark Mayford Laboratory. They used uh, transgenic mouse with the lag Z expression under uh, promoter of uh, one of the immediate early genes, ZIF. But uh, it was also uh, TET uh, or controlled so that under doxycycline, there is no activity. Then there is, uh, for example, a fear conditioning episode, which uh, uh, is uh, under uh, suppression uh, of that O, so that there is an expression of transgene. And the lag Z will stay in these neurons for a number of days. And then uh, several days later, you can do it three days, you can do it uh, a week later, uh, you can stain uh, subject animals to retrieval episode and stain the second population immuno, just immunogistochemically. So you will have uh, two uh, populations, one from the previous experience, uh, remote experience, and another from the recent experience, retrieval. And you can see whether acquisition and retrieval uh, are localized to the same neurons, which uh, was done in this uh, science paper from Mayford Laboratory. And it shows that uh, the neurons which were involved uh, in uh, acquisition uh, are uh, strongly involved in the retrieval. So thank you very much. <coughs>